to be your words, not mine. I don't want to just preach to people tonight. I want to give the revelation that you've downloaded in my heart. And, Lord, I know that you spoke within my heart just a little over a week ago that we're going to have a night that we're going to anoint women to come forth in ministry. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we are responding as yes and amen to be obedient to what you want to do in Jesus' name. So the first thing I did in studying this topic is I looked on the Internet to find all the junk. And it's not hard to find. All you got to do is say, should women pay pastors? And you really find a whole lot of stuff that has nothing to do with love, and nothing to do with hope. In fact, it's, it's a whole lot to do with the shut up mentality. Trying to shut women down. And that's exactly what I mean. Shutting the women up in ministry and of, of all kinds. And God told me the reason I went this route is because he wanted me to see the revelations that are out there that aren't God. They're simple, single-minded revelations. You can take one scripture and make it mean whatever you want to. If you ignore its context. If you take it out of context, it can mean what you want it to mean. But if you read all the context, that's not what they were saying at all. And I went into deep study of this by the Spirit. And I give the Holy Spirit credit because I, don't, I, I, I didn't do it. He took me into it. And I love how he did this. So, uh, like I said before, I could preach all night about this. But I just am trying to keep it as small as I can just to give you the truth. So if you're taking notes tonight, I'm going to give a lot of scripture for you to write down. I'm going to read some scripture. But I'm going to have you write down a lot of them because I don't want to have time to read all the scriptures. And you need to read them when you get home. Because you need to study out what I preach, just like you should study out what anyone preaches. And that's the problem. The preachers that preach about women are not supposed to ever speak. They really don't uh, ever, ever get, get even checked out to see if they're preaching truth. We just receive it because they're preachers. We don't need to receive it if it's a lie. And that's what it is. It's a lie trying to hold women back. And it's been happening for a long, long time. But we're breaking the, breaking the spirit realm tonight. And St. Louis, Belleville, Illinois, Missouri region, there's going to be a breaking open of women come forth in this hour. Come on. So ministry women come forth is what I'm talking about. And I'm going to anoint you with oil tonight. But understand, there's a, a revision of all the faiths I found, even ordination articles that has to do with Pentecostal, Charismatic, Baptist, all kinds of different denominations. I found them all, every one of them, had this revision put in their bylaws, in their, in their ordination rules and regulations, even in their constitutions. And this was even in one of mine that I came from. But I'm not in that no more, just so you know. Hallelujah. But here's what it says. The office of the pastor is limited to men only. Every one of them, Pentecostal, charismatic, and I, I've checked many of them, and I'm talking about details. This is what it says in their bylaws, in their rules, in their constitutions. And I'm telling you, we need to take heed to this. What's happening right now is the current church leaders, and this is one leader that is considered an apostle to our nation. He said this. Our positions and our perspectives are not going to be dictated by the culture. They're going to be dictated by Scripture. So if we stand alone in the belief that women should not be pastors, then the rest of the church is not biblical. That's what they said. And I'm telling you, this is what pastors are saying, that if we believe that women are supposed to come forth, that we're not lining up with the Bible. You know what? That's a lie from the pit of hell. In fact, that's a, that's a rude statement. What, you know, I would rather them say, in my opinion, women should not be pastors. And I would respect that because that's an opinion. But to say that they know it all and there's no way that they could be wrong, and that everybody else has to be wrong. That is a, 
and I put it just like the Spirit of God dropped in my spirit. And I want to, and that's a pompous nonsense thinking. Come on. Those who believe that the Bible rejects women pastors and those who give culture to accept women pastors is what they said. So in other words, they're saying because of the culture of women getting more freedom, that's the only reason that people are adjusting. Adjusting for the culture. When I was first starting to come into ministry, I was taught women were not to be in ministry of any kind. Not to prophesy, not to preach, not to sing. In other words, they come in and they to look good on the man's arm. That's it. That's all. They're done. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, God said, I'm going to change some things about you. One day he said this to me. And I was like, well, I don't know what that means, but praise God. <laughs> I was at a church, a little church in a little town in Bond County, Illinois. I'm sitting in this little church, and a man was preaching, and God said, this is your new church. I said, well, praise God. I said, I just feel good about this place. And uh, the preacher stops preaching after he got done preaching and ministered to a couple people, and he said, well, I just want to thank the pastor for giving me an opportunity today, and I want to call her up, call her uh, call her up, and when he said that, I pretty much lost everything. I was my, like, what? God, you set me up. You gave me a woman pastor. I don't even believe they're supposed to do anything, and they're supposed to be a pastor now. And it changed me. I was there just about three or four months, but it was just enough to get me changed. I got revelation. God began to cause me to see things in Scripture. You know what happens is when we don't have a revelation, we get blind. When we don't have it and somebody else preaches it to you, you get blind. And that's what happens in a lot of diff different uh, religions is people are blind until they walk out of it. And then they see. A lot of people who used to be Catholic, when they walk out of it, they're able to see how wrong Catholic was. But at, when they're in it, they don't see it. And I'm not trying to come against Catholic because I know some real God-fearing Catholics. Come on, they really love the Lord and on fire for God and have their spirit filled. They just have a different belief in some things. Come on. But let's go on. I'm not preaching about that tonight. There are people who adamantly support women pastors on biblical grounds, and I am one of them. I support it because, and I will make, uh, uh, make people understand sometimes because it's an aggression that comes in me. If I see a wrong in the church, the first thing I want to do is study Scripture. I don't just give my opinion. I'm going to go into Scripture because the Word of God is what sets us free. Because the truth of the Word of God is what's going to set us free. So one of the first things I want to talk about is Jesus and women. And the reason I'm doing this is because Jesus had a lot of women in his life that were in ministry. And how many know that's when a lot of things begin to change in the Bible is when Jesus came on the scene. And that's the most important thing. A lot of people, they can talk about, well, that was in the Old Testament. But I just want to go ahead and start right in the New. Come on. Hallelujah. Jesus was very radical in the way that he treated women because he involved women in his ministry. In order to appreciate what Jesus did, one must understand the culture that Jesus lived in. It was not received the way he responded to women. Come on. People did not like it, especially religion. And one of the demons that is doing or, or holding back women in this hour is religion. The Jewish culture, uh, in the Jewish law, a woman was considered property, not a person. Come on. She either belonged to her father or belonged to her husband. She was not allowed to study the law. In the synagogue, women were shut apart from the men so that they could not be seen. Nor could a woman acti actively participate in the synagogue services. She had to passively sit and listen. Come on, isn't that true? This is what the Word of God has in it. Come on. And nor could she teach the children. 
See, that's what the women have been pushed to, to teach the children. You know why? Because that is a way they can just pacify a woman. You can teach the children. Let me tell you, women of God, you have a lot more to do than just teach children. We need the children to be taught, but we need women to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We're going to get into some things. I'll get there in a minute. A woman was not required to attend the sacred feasts and festivals. One Jewish uh, morning prayer said by free Jewish men was to thank God that they had not been born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Come on. This is religion that I'm talking about. Their belief was to thank God. I wasn't born a slave. A Gentile or a woman. I know some Jewish people today still pray this prayer. And women don't say it, but they believe it. The Greek culture, the Greeks as a whole, held a low view of women. There were women that were called priestesses in the Greek religions, but these women were most often Sacred prostitutes. Come on. Well, they get a title anyway. Come on. Come on. I don't know about you, but I want to know everything that God has wants to reveal to us tonight. Proper Greek women were confined to their quarters. They never went to public in public alone. They never attended public assemblies. Women, women's purposes was essentially to serve their husbands. Jesus, he, he, how many know Jesus had a response to all this? Because when we turn to Jesus, it is clear that he disregarded the common practice of the Jews and the Greeks and extended his ministry. And message to women. In fact, even rabbis in the day of the word of God were never allowed to speak to a woman in public. Come on. You know, really, religion hasn't come too far. They've just tried to change the way they do it. There's even a church in India I was invited to. The women sit on one side, the men sit on the other. Come on. Now, some of you say that don't sound too bad, but that's just because you need counseling. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that's not saying women are, men, are less than men. Come on. See, we need to understand. One thing I want to get at point across tonight is once Jesus came, a whole lot of things changed. Come on. Jesus was contrary to uh, customs. He talked with and taught women. He taught the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 27. Come on. Jesus talked publicly with the unclean woman who touched his cloak in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. Come on. And when he taught and fed the multitudes, women were in the crowd in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 through 21, and Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. Now, when he healed the Canaanite woman's daughter, he talked with her in public. I'm just putting it all contrary to their laws that they set. And that was in Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. Now, he commended... Mary for listening and and uh, for uh, listening to his teaching when Martha complained that she wasn't helping with the housework. That was in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 through 42. We're going somewhere. Just just hang on. I got to break it all to break it right. Come on. Contrary to custom, Jesus allowed women to be deeply involved in his ministry. The gospels recorded that there were women who traveled with him to assist his work. 
The Gospels did not tell every name of the women. But here's the names. They include Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And this is all in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, Matthew chapter 27, verses 55 and 56. This is listing the women that worked in his ministry. Already messed up a lot of theology. And we haven't even got started. I really haven't even got started. Come on. Jesus broke the common treatment of women because he talked with them in public when nobody was supposed to as a man. He taught women about religion in public forums and private forums. He gave women an active role in his ministry. All broke the back of religion. So now let's go to the next place. What happened with women even bigger? The early church. Come on. The early church, following the lead of Jesus, had women actively involved in all aspects of the church life. The book of Acts, I tell you, one sees a church open to women. Women were praying with the apostles prior to Pentecost in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Come on. Praying with the apostles. That didn't sound like a quiet one. Come on. One day of Pentecost, Peter proclaimed the dawning of a new day which God's Spirit would empower men and women to speak and to teach God's message. Is what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Come on, I've done all the work for you. Let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. I've got all kinds. Of, I, come on, you need to take heed to this. I, 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 God, the Holy Spirit got to be your concordance tonight. Come on. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. It says, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Whew. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. They, all of them, shall prophesy. So already this scripture alone breaks the back of all kinds of things that the people preach. We're not even done. This is just the beginning. Come on, this is powerful. Paul taught a group of women in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, verse 13. Why would he teach them if they couldn't do anything? In uh, Berea, Paul taught a woman and even a, a woman in Acts chapter 17, verse 12. Priscilla was one of the Apollos, according to the scripture, and the teachers. Acts chapter 18, verse 26. Come on. Some of you might just need to get the CD to get all these scriptures. Hallelujah. Philip had four daughters who were prophetic in Acts chapter 21, verse 9. Let's look at this. The scripture in Acts 21, verse 9. And the same man had four virgins, four daughter virgins, which did prophesy. Some Bible translations say they were prophets. It doesn't matter to me. They spoke the word of the Lord. That's contrary to what people are preaching today. Come on. Paul's letters indicated that women were deeply involved in his ministry. Perhaps the best example of women's involvement in his letter to the church to Rome. Because in the sixth chapter of Romans, Paul mentions numerous women in active, prominent roles in the church. The first is Phoebe. Come on, who served as a deacon in verses 1 and 2. In 16th chapter of, of verse 1 and 2, Priscilla is called a, his fellow worker in verses 3 and 4. Come on, this is chapter 16 still, hallelujah, of Romans. Mary is mentioned as a diligent worker. Come on, we got so many scripture, you're not going to be able to keep up if you're not writing fast. She is mentioned as a diligent worker in the church at Rome in verse 6. 
Junia, a woman, is called an apostle. In verse 7, and this is in, in, the, in the new King James, the King James Version, and the, and the NRSV Version. Three women uh, uh, were mentioned as hard workers for the Lord in verse 12. In other letters to, uh, of Paul, one finds references of women praying and prophesying in public in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. Ah, I love this. I'm, I, I could just see, hear the walls breaking in, in the spirit. And contending at his side in the cause of the gospel in Philippians chapter 4, verse 23. Come on, you don't find this stuff with concordance. The Holy Spirit takes you there. Come on. Also, in his letter to Timothy, Paul gives instructions about women deacons. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. It talks about and their wives. See, the simple thing that they try to take is that just means the men are the deacons. That's a misinterpretation. It says and their wives. It doesn't say and they will have wives. We'll get into that some other time. Not yet. Come on. Hallelujah. Let's break it open. Coupled with these examples of women in ministry, there are three basic theological truths which seem to indicate women should be involved in all aspects of church life. First, there is no indication that any spiritual gift was just given to men anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't say it anywhere in the Bible. There is not one passage you can find that says all the gifts were limited to just women. Why would that be? And we can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 31. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Second, all God's people were called his priests. And it had nothing to do with just males. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Third, all human distinctions were removed. All human distinctions were removed in Christ who united them. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. You know why? Because he was there to break everything. And that was part of the law he was breaking. Come on. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Here's what it says. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Mm. <laughs> I just got some Holy Ghost bumps. Come on. For you are all one in Christ. Come on. And we're still not even there yet. Come on. We've got so much farther to go. Come on. Paul believed that through faith in Jesus Christ, all became God's children, one family, which those things that separated them were broken down. Now, Jews and Gentiles were of the same family. The Christian master now saw the slave as an equal brother. Come on. And the man now saw the woman as an equal human being, as a sister in Christ. It changed. No longer property, but now one. Now just the same. So here's a summary just of this section of what I've been talking about. Women were inactively in part of many areas of teachers, prophets, deacons, and apostles. Women were included in worship and religious instruction as active participants. The basic theology of spiritual gifts, priesthood of all believers, and oneness in Christ Jesus all moved toward the idea that women were serving in an unlimited capacity in the church. This still probably would not convince the critics because they have two wonderful scriptures that we got to still tear apart. How many want to tear them apart? Come on, and I don't do this arrogantly. I do this because I hate blind people. 
Come on. There's a veil over, over the church's eyes. How much more could we do if we had women and children working side by side with us? Come on. So here's answering the critics. In the light of all that, that, uh, of this, one may begin to wonder upon the basis. Do some people want to stop and restrict women from serving as a pastor? There's two major texts that I want to use that I found all over the Internet. And I want to use them because I first I got what they put out, and then I studied it out myself because I don't just take somebody's word for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 through 35, Paul says in, in this scripture, women should remain silent in churches. Clear as day. You know, it sounds pretty rough. It sounds like I just lost the battle, didn't it? But understand, God said, you're about to have some fun. And I got into some things. They were not allowed to speak but must be in submission. As the law says, if they want to inquire, listen, about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Think about this. This passage is hard to harmonize with the rest of the New Testament that we see women taking an active role in the church. If God's word does not harmonize, that means it's out of order. Scripture harmonizes. If it has a theme in one place, it doesn't have a theme in one place where Jesus never leaves you or nor forsakes you. Then there's another place where he just throws you off the cliff. He stays in harmony. So understand, if there is something not in harmony, then there must be a reason. So it is being spoken to something more singular than plural. More then than now. <laughs> I love it. Come on. This is good stuff. This is like a Bible study that we all should have. Okay. This passage is even harder to harmonize with what Paul said earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. Remember, 1 Corinthians is before he said this. Look at this. Here's what he said. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. This is what he said in 11 verse 5, or 11 verse 15. So in 14, chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, he says, women should remain silent in the church. Does it quite seem to work out? Why does it say that? Why would he say one direction and now say another? Here Paul was talking about appropriate dress by Christian women so the outside world would not judge them wrongly. When it said in verse chapter 11, verse 15, Every woman who prays or prophesies will do it with her head covered. Come on, that was the belief. But he did say they would what? Prophesy. So why would he say keep silent later? Did his theology change? No. See, we take it out of context is what happened. The church has taken it out of context. But the key point we need to notice is that Paul here speaks of, a, of, of women praying and prophesying. I do not believe that Paul is so inconsistent that within the same letter, he tells women how to dress, when to speak, in worship, and then tells women to be quiet. This is how you're going to prophesy. This is how you're going to worship. This is how you're going to be. But now shut up. Come on. Context. The best explanation, let's look at this. So how could one understand what Paul says in verse 14 or chapter 14? The best uh, explanation is that Paul's advice here is only temporary. Be quiet. Be silent. 
The thinking of this view goes along with the line in verse 34 and 35 because they are part of a larger section. If you look at verse 34 and 35, it sounds like women should never preach and should be silent. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26 through 40, he's dealing with order. The church was out of order, and specifically women were the ones out of order. It didn't have anything to do with them being women. It just happened to be women. So you got to look at chapter 14, verse 26 through 40, where it talks about how out of order they were. So he went after them. Come on. And it just happened to be women, so he wasn't going to mention anybody else. Mm. He was trying to bring some order back into the church and worship. Apparently, the women at Corinth were the main ones who were causing disorder in the church and worship service. So Paul made a temporary rule. How many have ever been a pastor? Come on, if you're a pastor, how many have a temporary rule every once in a while? Come on, it's a temporary rule. And it was for a bad situation until the church got back on its feet functioning correctly. The women were to keep silent and worship because they were doing things out of order. How many have ever been in a service where you're worshiping and things are going pretty good and somebody just starts blurting out prophetic word that just doesn't fit? And it disrupts the service? It doesn't fit. It might be a word from the Lord, but it's not in order. Nobody's got a submitted at all. I could see myself saying, you need, you know, woman needs to be quiet. Come on. But that doesn't mean the next time I won't have a woman minister. Come on. Is that right? Come on. Hmm. It is much like a governor or ordering martial law on a city to be struck by disaster. The martial law is temporary until things are restored to normal. Paul's command here is a temporary rule. Unlim the ultimate goal was to be like the rest of the churches. That's what he was trying to do. Where there was no restrictions placed on women. Now, some may disagree with that interpretation, but here's a big key. Based on the last part of verse 33, if you read the NIV or the TEV translation, these versions put the last part of verse 33 in the same sentence of verse 34. Consequently, the verses read something like this. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the church. That's what a Bible says right now. There's a few Bibles I looked at. They all say that. In all churches, the women should keep silent in the church. In all churches. That's not what the original text says. If you look up the original text, the concordance doesn't even know those words. Those words are faded out in my, in my computer program and even in the actual hardcover. It's, it's not even there because they have misinterpreted. They have changed the actual Bible even today to try to back this doctrine. That's how important I, it is for me to preach it. Come on. But here's, here's, a, here's a kicker. Clearly, women keeping silent in the churches was, was a practice of every church if we accept the translation. But King James Version and the New American Standard Version and the Living Bible separate the last part of verse 33 from 34. Instead, they make the verse 33 a whole sentence. The King James Version reads, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Period. The teaching being all the churches have orderly worship. Not all the churches keep women silent. It's a little different. Little bit different, doesn't it? Come on. And if this didn't line up with the original, I wouldn't have read it. 
It lines up with what the original Bible says. The King James Version I use in all my books, most of my books, all the time, is from 1511. You know why? Because that was a Bible they didn't mess up yet. <laughs> Some of the brand new NIVs have so much butchered stuff in it. One of these days I'm going to preach it. They took the blood of Jesus out of it. There's no Antichrist in it. Come on. There's some real stuff they just ripped out of the Bible. Not even in there anymore. That's not a Bible. The Bible says at the end of Revelations, do not add to nor take away. Come on. One may wonder why the translators can't decide whether to put a, the phrase as in all ch the churches of the saints with the sentence of verse 33, with the, verse 34. The reason is that the original Greek text did not have punctuation. Translators had to guess where the sentence started and stopped. The problem is placing the phrase with verse 34 and that verse contradicts the verse in 11, chapter 11, verse 5, where women were prophesying. Come on. That's, what, that's how I look at it. It has to be in the whole context. It is best to see verse 33 as one sentence as King James in the New American Standard Bible does have. Now, also, the fact of their, verse 34 and 35 float around in the text su suggests that the early readers did not understand verse 33 to be tried with verse 34. So here we go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is the other. This is a whole other ball of wax. Whole other issue. Whole different one. Because if I can beat that one, uh, you got to understand you got to beat the other one too. And understand, this is the thing, is this is the one that most preachers preach. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, the second passage requiring attention, it's found in Paul's letter to Timothy. Now, Paul says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. My goodness. Let me first of all say I've known some very powerful prophetic women, powerful pastors that are women. And I tell you, God would not put his anointing on these women if there was any truth in this scripture. First and foremost, God's, you know them by their fruit. They're not going to have good fruit if they're not lining up with the word. Amen. Come on. Amen. But let's go another step farther. Here the question must be asked, why did Paul make such a command? The rational thinking for this command is found in a church crisis caused by false teaching. Think about that. And I could have just said, well, it's probably the same thing as the other. But that's, not, that's just assuming. That's the problem with interpretation of the Bible, as, as assumptions, somebody's idea. I don't want to assume, even if I think I'm right. Come on. Everybody should receive that. Where Timothy was working was an area plagued with false teaching. If you really study all this scripture out in 1 Timothy, there was a whole lot of false teachings going on. There's some context. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. Paul wanted Timothy to combat these false teachers in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I believe these false teachers had made inroads into the churches through the women, especially young women. And we can see that in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, verses 11 through 15. You can study out yourself because God said tonight, you need to get your own revelation. Don't just take my word for it. So Paul tells these women in the church where Timothy is working to keep silent and not to teach in order to stop the spreading of false doctrine. This is what I am believing. Let's go a little step farther. Because Paul says in verse, the verses immediately following, in verse 13 and 14, 
For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Come on, that's what he says right after. He's referring to women who were first deceived, and he was afraid those women were going to deceive others. This is the truth. Come on. Let's go a step farther. Hmm. Paul evidently wanted women of the church where Timothy was working to keep silent because he was afraid they would deceive someone just like Eve did. Again, Paul is giving special orders to meet a bad situation. These orders were not for all churches for all time. For the sake of space, we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 just a little bit more, which many consider to be the Bible's clearest statement against women. But understand this. Functioning in leadership, it says, I'm going to repeat it one more time. Let women learn in silence in all submission. I do not permit women to teach or have authority over a man, but keep silent. On the surface, out of context, it looks like it's clear, but I'm telling you it is not. Let's look at this. First, all, all the scripture has to be included. Why is that there? What happened before that to cause that scripture to come forth? First Timothy was written to an individual. Anybody got that? First Timothy was written to an individual. It wasn't written to a church. It wasn't written to the church. <laughs> I love when God exposes some things that just dropped in my spirit. Come on. We should expect, therefore, that the things written in this letter related to a situation or an individual. In verse 3 of chapter 1, it clearly states the reason for this letter. It is to encourage and instruct him to deal with false teaching that is circulating among the Christians in, in Ephesus, which here was located, and it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. But I'm telling you, here's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, I went to Macedonia, that thou might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This is preceding that. Come on. That Paul is addressing a unique situation. I know this is just teaching, just cramming all kinds of stuff in you, but I'm telling you this is powerful. It's powerful. It's powerful. I'll preach some other time, not tonight. Paul is addressing a unique situation in Ephesus. It's further born out of the fact that the word authority in, in, in chapter 2, verse 12, in a translation I love this. Of uh, the Greek word, which is found only here in the, in the entire New Testament. This is the only time that word authority in that translation was here. Because Paul, <laughs> Paul is here giving a universal uh, thing for the church order. If it was, why doesn't he use the normal word for authority? which is excusia, and which he and all the other New Testament writers used. But instead, he used a different word, a different word just here, right there in that scripture for authority. And we're going to get into it in a second. Why does he use a word that neither nor any other New Testament writer ever used the word and refers to someone who claims to be the author and the originator of something? He uses an entire different word for authority because it was a unique situation. It wasn't worldwide, universal. Come on. Why was that there? That's a question. Anybody still here? 
Come on, we're not that far away. Hallelujah. I got a lot done. Come on. Chains are breaking, women. This view is born out of the fact that there is a change from the plural to the singular and then back to the plural passage. Because in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2, Paul refers to women in the plural. But then he comes in verses 11 and 12, he changes it back to a woman. And then in verse 15, he returns to she instead of women. Come on. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, if this scripture was right, why would it say it this way? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, charity, holiness, and sobriety. Why would it say it? She, if it was for all women. This is the way he's concluding this thing. Why would he go back to she? It was dealing with an individual. Somebody was out of order. Somebody was spreading false doctrine. That's what the scripture was literally for. It was out of context. Come on. This may indicate, come on, that the writing in this passage, Paul had a particular woman in mind who was primarily responsible for spreading the false teaching to Ephesus. Be, let, be that as it may, Paul in this passage is obviously addressing a unique local situation in a city. It was not for everyone for eternity. So who says a woman can't be a pastor? Not Jesus, not Paul, and not the New Testament. So if they all are in agreement that women can come forth as a mighty warrior, then why are we in agreement? And I haven't even messed with Deborah in the Word of God. I haven't messed with Esther in the Word of God. I try to go where we haven't gone. Anybody can use all those scriptures. I wanted to go where we haven't gone. So here's the conclusion. The Bible teaches that women do have an active role in every aspect of the church. Under leadership of God's Spirit, the two times when Paul restricts women were under special circumstance to establish order to check and spread heresy. Come on. That's what the Scripture, I proved that with Scriptures before. you got to look at the entire context. You don't look at the one single Scripture. Paul was trying to get sick churches back in order. Paul and the Early church did not ever establish rules to limit the freedom of the spirit work in the lives of women. The spirit can work in the life of any woman and lead her to any role in the church. We proved that there were apostles. We proved there were prophets. We proved that women were actually working side by side with Jesus in a vital part of his ministry. And I'm telling you, and, and, and even Paul preached about women prophesying the word of the Lord right before he deals with certain women. Come on. All the scriptures are on the CDs, and you guys really want to get those scriptures and just study them out because all you've got to do is confirm and confirm again and confirm again. One student one time, he came to me, not in any of these students, just so you know, and he obviously was disturbed with, the, with what I was preaching about women could preach. So he came up to me and he goes, could you show me one place in the New Testament where a woman ever functioned as a pastor? I love it when the Holy Spirit drops something in me. And this is what happened. The Holy Spirit dropped in me and I, here's what I answered him because I wrote it down as soon as I said it because I, I was like, man, I got to preach that. If you will show me first one place where a man ever functioned as a pastor. I'll show you a place if you can show me a place. Now, here's the thing. Because every gift, all the gifts of the Spirit never had a man in it, never had a woman in it. Listen, here's the powerful part. He was stunned because he couldn't think of an example. Here's what my answer was designed for. It was to show him how we read biblical text. We read it in part. 
we read our piece that we like. You know, I don't know about you, but I like certain pieces of pie. You bring me certain pieces, I don't want them, but I want some pie, I'll take the whole thing. Come on. The church is still in their cafeteria mode. They just want what they want, and they try not to receive the rest. And if they find out what they want to know, they don't even look for any more. Come on. Remember, in the very beginning of this, I told you that I didn't even believe that women were supposed to be pastors. And then God came on the scene and changed me and gave me revelation. And like I said, there's so much more scripture we could get into, but man, we just blew you with all kinds of it just tonight. The church must recognize the Spirit's leadership and not develop rules to restrict the Spirit because when we restrict women, we restrict the Holy Spirit. Woo, powerful, come on. People could tell me that I misinterpret the Bible because my culture influenced me, but I use the Word of God to set the truth out to set you free. But if you say that, the sword cuts both ways because could it be that your culture, which has already tried to restrict women's roles, causing you to interpret the Bible the way you do? Religious culture has caused interpretation that is false. It is, a fair, it is fair to brand everyone. Is it fair to brand everyone who doesn't interpret the Bible the way you do? Come on. Can we agree to disagree sometimes? Are you always perfect in your understanding of Scripture? I don't know about you. Has anybody ever got a revelation that you didn't have before? That's why they call it revelation. A couple dozen scriptures shows women ministering in the Bible, prophesying the word of the Lord in the Bible, working side by side, Paul, working in the days of Peter and John, working in the days of the book of Acts, working in the days... And speaking, and all the, even the, the worst cases that speak literally word for word for word. If you look in a pure context, and somebody, you guys need to study those previous scriptures that prove that they were in disorder or they were releasing false teachings. That's the only thing that caused women to be out of order. But you know why women were out of order? Here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I want you to hear this. Because... They didn't get the change and the shift and the release until Jesus came. Men had been doing it so long, but women didn't have anything. So when they started doing it, they probably were so excited, so out of order. Could you see a woman just getting set free? She probably was like, I just got a word. I got a word. Because they were quiet so long. Come on. They got the muzzle off. Come on. That's what I see in the spirit. That's why they were out of order, because they had to shut up for hundreds of years. All of a sudden, somebody said, hey, you can prophesy. They were like, hey, I'm on. Come on. So we start singing around the campfire, and all of a sudden, the woman starts, hey, I got a word, I got a word, I got a word. Out of order. Think about it. People don't look and think about things that aren't there. I think about things that aren't there. I could just, could you see her it, it, back in that day? She'd be like, hey, uh, 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 Paul. Paul. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> Paul, I got a word. I got a word, Paul. Give me the microphone. And see, back then, they didn't have sound systems, so they couldn't even shut off the mic. The woman just started belting it out, and you're like, somebody shut her off. Flip the switch, man. I had to end it with some fun, but it's true. Come on. Here's what it's like. It's like children. Sometimes church starts, and they get tired immediately. As soon as the service starts, I mean, they're tired. They're sleepy. They've got to take a nap. As soon as the service is over, 
Somebody's given them an injection of B12. <laughs> They're ready to go. That's what, that's what women in that day probably were like. They were just so excited to finally be able to actually speak, to prophesy, to be a part of the action. Because in the belief system, up to that point, they were to keep quiet. They were to keep silent. They was not allowed to be any part. Then Jesus came, and everything shifted. Amen. Everything came alive again. And then the scripture that should break all the back of everything that the enemy and all the critics say is whenever it says that we all become one. That right there should break the back of it all. Because that means anytime it says man in the Bible, it also says woman. Anytime it says it, it's talking about all of us. That breaks it all. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. You receive it tonight. Come on. Come on. Woo. I'm so glad you had. Uh, we got women from all over tonight. Come on. I'm just so glad you came here. And, and I want to anoint you tonight, so just hang on to your hat. Don't get in a hurry because I want to minister. I really believe God wants to pour out the word of the Lord to some of you. Some of you, the shackles are coming off when you leave this place, and you're going to actually find a level of freedom. Some of you don't realize, some of you, older generation that may be here, and you, ha you know what it's like to be held back because you've been held back because you've been that generation. But some of this younger generation, they don't have a clue. They're like, what is he talking about? Women being held back? I mean, we get to do everything. You know, women are more than just to look pretty for us. Just to be quiet and to pretty. They're to be a vital part. And they're to speak up. And I'm telling you, the ministries that are changing their doctrines to literally feed this devil to say women are never supposed to do anything in the church. I really feel sorry for them because if you don't receive a woman and a gift within her, you're not receiving the Holy Spirit. And if you despise the youth, I'm going to throw that one in there too because that's another thing being held back is the children. Sometimes we shove them off to children's church because we want babysitters. If they're not being trained, if they're not being equipped to be ministers, then they are not being shoved to a right place. They need to be equipped. Come on. And I believe they need to be in some of the action, some of the revival meetings. Come on. Right here in this place. Come on. And actually be, be touched and healed, set free, delivered. Come on. Children grow, I tell you. They do. I mean, we can't do nothing at home without a child trying to rebuke us in some way or another. Come on. You say anything wrong, they just say, I bind that in the name of Jesus. I was like. Come on now, that's just not even right. Hallelujah. If a 10-year-old tells you or an 11-year-old tells you that you need to be bound by what you just said, then my goodness. Hallelujah. Are you guys receiving? And I'm telling you, because of what just took place, there's going to be a stirring in some churches. It's going to be some stirring. But what I want you to do is take the Scripture. Study it over and over and over again. Amen. Don't just take my word for it. Yes. Study the scriptures before it and after it. Yes. Study it in multiple translations. Don't just study an IV, especially stay away from that one. I would encourage you because if they already have given up, forget it. Come on. But I would study the word of God, and I would study multiple translations. And in the King James, right now, the older King James is probably the most accurate. The new King James ain't too bad, but I'm telling you, and the New America Standard was more accurate for this topic. But I'm telling you, you've got to be careful. You do. You really do. Because it's time for women to come forth. It's time for the anointing of women to come forth. One time... I was mistakenly invited to a women's conference. <laughs> I, re I really was. I was like, I was invited, and I was, they told me uh, when to get there and everything, and uh, I, I, God said, go a half hour late, and I think he did it for me. 
Because I walked in and there was like 700 women. I was like, are you kidding? I go, uh, I mean, there wasn't one guy in the whole house. I was like, what is going on? Is this like a, am, or am I going to be burnt at the cross or something? I mean, come on. Am I going to be burnt up tonight? I mean, I was worried. I was like, that was too much female for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, the pastor, she, caught, she <laughs> caught my eye, and I looked up at her, and I go, she knew I was freaked out. I go, she come over, and she goes, are you ready? I go, for what? <laughs> she said, I go, did we get our dates mixed up or something? She goes, no. She goes, I asked you to come and speak whatever God puts on your heart. I go, where's the guys? She goes, this is a women's conference. I go, Why did you not tell me? Hallelujah. I mean, give me a detail. She goes, I'm sure God gave you something. I said, yeah, he did. And it has to be, it, it, the title was Sons of God. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm not even in the right ballpark right now. I got up there and I thought, I'm going to have to whip something up. I kept trying. I couldn't whip nothing. <laughs> Finally, I opened my Bible, and I started preaching about sons of God. I preached to a bunch of women, 700 women I preached to, about becoming sons of God and being sons of God and being close to God. And my goodness. Whew. I was, it, man, I, I was set up is what happened. I was so messed up, I, I tried to stay on the stage. So I would call people up and tell them, stop right there. I don't even want you to come near me. Because I, I, was, I was scared of women back then. I mean, I was like, I didn't want to touch no woman. I was like, forget you all. Hallelujah. And it had nothing to do with poison or anything. It was just, you know, I was trying to be proper. So I was like, you stay about 20 feet away. I'll be okay. Stop right, oh, right there. Don't go across that line. And I would let, you know, release some God. <laughs> so that's how God set you up sometimes. He'll put you right in a conference. So, so after that day, from then on, I, every time I get invited to do anything, I, I sometimes ask a lot of questions. <laughs> what is this for? Is there going to be any people there? <laughs> Are they from this planet? <laughs> Come on, I need details, man. Talk to me. If you're going to be vague, I'm not coming. So some of you don't even know how powerful this is for me to preach this. And all the background that I've come out of and all the different ministries and the quotes that I brought today came from ministries I used to be associated with. You know, they have apostles and they have prophets, and some of them even ordained the men and the women. But you know what they ordained the women to be? If you look in the fine line, it says to be their wife. They're not ministers. I don't know if they put that on their certificate. I'm ordained to be his wife. I don't know. You know, you think they would get it catch on if they saw that on the certificate. So he's ordained to be a minister and you're ordained to be his wife. Cool. But that's what it says in the actual commitment to work in their ministry. Come on, I used to be committed to that. Now I just had to be committed. Hallelujah. (laughs) 
So I'm telling you, I've been set free so that I could preach to you. Come on. Here's what's happening. I don't know if this, this don't need to be recorded. If it's not, I'm not trying not to be recorded. But it's getting to a place soon. You're going to have to make a choice. If you're going to be going to a church, it needs to be preaching the truth. If it's saying things that are contrary to the truth, like despising the youth, keeping women, not doing anything for the things of God, and even uh, the preaching that says once you're divorced, you're condemned for life. All these things are being preached all over the world. And what it does is it condemns a lot of people. It puts a lot of people in bondage. It's not religion. It's condemnation. It's worse than religion. And I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of doctrine out there. Once saved, always saved. Talk about things. My goodness. We need to be true. We need truth. The truth is what sets you free. So we need truth. Come on. I've written about 30 books in the past couple of years, but understand this is tonight, God said, that I'm going to be writing a book, some, some about this that I just preached about tonight. And we're going to address everything that is, that needs revelation that people preach against. People preach against speaking in tongues all the time, still. They preach against apostles and prophets for today. It's clear in the Word of God. You know, they're the foundation. We need apostles and prophets and I'm telling you, there's so much of this stuff that really needs to be truth revealed in our hearts today. Some of you in this room, you have an anointing, and you have a gifting and ability, and it's time for you to step on in and to be used and utilized. I'm talking to you women, to the fullness that God has for you. And tonight, you're going to be broke out of where you've been. Supernaturally. Come on. Let's give God the glory. I don't know how I preached only an hour tonight. I had 16 pages. I never, ever have preached that fast in my life. I don't know how in the world. I thought for sure it was going to be two CDs, but we're okay. Hallelujah. I'm going to minister, so we need to switch. Hallelujah. 